This episode of Manage Smarter is presented by Sales Fuel Coach, our adaptive sales coaching featuring five-minute quick coaching personalized to each sales rep. Learn more about Sales Fuel Coach at salesfuel.com. Welcome to the Manage Smarter Podcast with hosts C. Lee Smith and Audrey Strong. We're glad you're here for discussions on new ways to manage smarter, hire, develop, and retain talent, improve results, and propel team performance to new heights. This is the Manage Smarter Podcast. What are your core values? Have you really thought about that? And really, when you think about them, do you like what they are? Our guest today kind of went through that and had an epiphany. He is Scott McGowan, and he's the CEO of McGowan Braybender. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Manage Smarter Podcast. I am Audrey Strong. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at Sales Fuel. And I'm C. Lee Smith, the President and CEO of Sales Fuel. And uh, yeah, Audrey, I went through a similar situation not, not too long ago, and it's very uncomfortable, right, Scott? <laughs> No question about it. <laughs> well, well, let me tell uh, our listeners a little bit about uh, Scott, um, the CEO of McGowan Braybender, an employee benefit consulting, compliance, and health risk management company. He works on vision casting, strategy alignment, and leadership deployment. As a business leader, it's always been about people for him, always has been, and always will be, and we love that. Um, and Scott also believes that understanding your core is the essence of transformation. And we'd also like to mention he's a fellow podcaster and your podcast, Scott, is named Side Effects, which is a clever name. Welcome. Effects, effects with an A, not an E. <laughs> You're exactly right. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Just super grateful. Yeah. So do you want to share a little bit about, you know, the, your story, which was really moving to me about how you came to a point where you fell over a cliff and just completely transformed yourself? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. You know, we learn um, the most often in life when we, uh, when we make gigantic mistakes. And fortunately, by the grace of God, I had somebody that was willing to call me on the carpet and kind of tell me the truth when, uh, quite frankly, there's a lot of people that weren't. So, mm -hmm. uh, I had my assistant come in about 18 years ago and say, uh, you have values painted on the wall. Uh, I have my own set of values. You don't live by any of them. Today's my last day. Woo. So that's kind of a, that's a mic drop for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately, um, uh, I was a, at least uh, in my arrogance, I was willing to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was more concerned about what people would think about her leaving. Um, what would they would think of me? Uh, versus her and that's really kind of when it hit me is hey, you might be a sick dude There might be some stuff inside of you. That's just kind of twisted uh, And it allowed me to maybe just start all over so um, who did I really want to be? Uh, what were my core values because I, I grew up as a chameleon. I think those of mm. us in sales we try to adapt to mm. people that uh, you know, we want to make a sale so we'll adapt to sarcasm or we'll adapt to cussing or we'll adapt to the engineer style and I was just good at that and the problem is is I woke up one day and I had no idea who I was. So how did you figure out who you were ultimately? You know, I hired a, uh, you know, I hired a coach um, so I asked her if, uh, if I hired a coach would she give me a shot? And uh, she said she would uh, under one condition. And that condition was is I had to go to her workspace every day and ask her three questions. And those were, Am, uh, are you okay? Am I okay? Are we okay? Uh, and so we had to have that conversation every day. And it was really the benefit of the coach that just kind of uh, allowed me to kind of like start all over. So I got really involved in leadership classes at UD. Uh, the University of Dayton. Uh, I got really involved in reading and really trying to understand um, what does leading people look like versus being successful financially. So you basically say that if you change these core values, you say your self-worth is performance plus the opinions of others equals self-worth. And I love this approach about leadership. We have never heard this from any guests on the show. Leadership is an inside job. Yeah, because a lot of people, um, you know, and I talk to a lot of high school and even college uh, students, like you better understand your core values before you go to work. Otherwise, an employer is going to define those values for you. Um, mm -hmm. And that'll be a sad day. Uh, and so my perception of self-worth was, uh, was messed up math. And that was the performance. How fast could I go? Uh, and then in my arrogance, the opinions of others just meant a lot to me. 
Uh, and so self-worth today is, uh, is not about the opinions of other people. And it's not about my performance. It's about my identity in myself. And do I believe in my core values? And do I exhibit those every day, everywhere, whether I'm on the golf course with some buddies or at a bar or hanging out at the mall or with my kids? Uh, I can't adapt to different personalities because I did it so for so often. And it just, quite frankly, it wore me out and society out. You know, and when you say it's an inside job, I, I'm guessing we're not talking about inside the company. We're, we're talking about inside yourself, right? Oh, no question about it. Yeah. And so, and they don't necessarily have to be related to your work. The five values that you came up with, some of them are centered around the home. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times as leaders, especially those of us that have found success is we think it's the clothes we wear, the car we drive, the neighborhoods we live in. It's the material things that visually say that I'm you know, successful. And unfortunately for a lot of us, if, you know, if you could sit us down in a dark place and kind of share our fears is we're, we're really afraid and, and we're lonely people. And fear is what's driving us in a lot of cases. Oh yeah, Lee, you're exactly right. I mean, fear, unfortunately is a great motivator. But in the wrong way. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. like, it's like a black hole. It just sucks the life well, out of you. It could be a blessing yeah. and a curse. It depends <laughs> on, on what you let, you know, how you let it work for you. Yeah, I think, there's, I think a lot of leaders are just afraid to be vulnerable. I mean, I think mm -hmm. when I was broken and I told people I'm broken and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm sorry, I think there's two things about that. One is it's amazingly humble if you're honest about it and being vulnerable and people want to help you. Uh, secondly, society loves underdogs. Everybody loves the underdog. Uh, and then when you could just kind of call yourself out as the underdog, like people want to help you. But it has to be honest. They also like a comeback story. So it's like it, when you reach that point, then and you have to re redefine who you are and you're showing that humility that, you know, hey, this is not the person who I want to be and I need to make changes and I'm going to do it publicly so you can all join in on my journey and, and hold me accountable, to make sure that I'm doing it every step of the way. It's uncomfortable, but it's like at the same point in time, I do think that it helps, you know, it brings them in and makes them stakeholders and, 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 you know, it makes it actually easier to do it publicly than it is to try to do it pu privately. Oh yeah. So why don't you share the five values that are your core values? And then I want to ask you how listeners can put this into motion in their own workplace and facilitate this, facilitate this with their team members. Um, but go ahead and give us your five. Yeah. So before the five, my five were really messed up. Um, okay. So these five, uh, are anchored to, you know, number one, and just unapologetic about, you know, my faith. It's, you know, it's my foundation and I'm not going to waver. Uh, I also think that um, I'm on the, I'm on the um, recruitment committee, not the membership committee. And when it, when it talks about, when I talk about faith and quite honestly, I, I, I believe no faith is faith in something too. So my job is hopefully just to love people for who they are. Uh, and when I think of what we're taught to do is it says to love our neighbor as ourselves or to do unto others as we would do to ourselves. The problem with that is, is if we don't love ourselves, humanity doesn't have a shot. Mm -hmm. um, so number two is my wife and I will never part. Um, number three is I am my own worst enemy and know it. That might be the greatest gift that I got in this self-awareness uh, discovery. Uh, number four is I believe most people outside of mental illness are, are good uh, and just need to be reminded that they're loved. Uh, and number five, I'll do everything that I can to protect the culture of McGowan and Braybender. And that's what they are today. And they could change. So you mentioned the company, Scott. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the company does? Yeah, so our vision is to empower business with solutions. So hopefully by, you know, hopefully we don't sell insurance because that would be a miserable existence. Um, what we do is we help employers uh, with neck up knowledge, manage benefits and costs. And so they can go back to doing what they love. And that's growing their companies, uh, empower people with choices uh, and hopefully deliver healthier birthdays uh, to society. And so we manage about 1,200 employers, uh, 100,000 employees across the state of Ohio about a billion and a half of healthcare spend. And I like to say a quarter of a, of a million belly buttons. That's moms, dads, kids, uh, people. Yeah, you, you mentioned faith and not being apologetic for your faith. I think so many people, like when they hear someone talk about faith or they demonstrate uh, their belief, 
something like that. It can be intimidating because they immediately think that, you know, oh my God, this person's got, literally, uh, this person's judging me, you know, and, and, you know, they're so judgmental or as if I don't believe what they believe or, the way, or practice things the way they practice things or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm, I get the feeling that's not what you're talking about there. No, no, not in any way. I mean, I think, you know, it, any form of faith in something outside of yourself is, um, quite frankly, I mean, there, that, that's admirable. Um, and I think a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of us just get so stuck in our own ways of thinking that we do, what we don't end up doing is we don't bring, bring people towards us. Uh, what we do is we end up just pushing people away. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's, and it's super sad because I think a lot of people are curious in regards to what people, uh, what, what people believe. And that, that includes things outside of, um, a God, if you mm-hmm. believe in a God, it's a belief in anything, a belief in yourself, a belief in humanity, a belief in your spouse, a belief in your kids. Uh, it's just an opportunity to create a different conversation with people. A belief in karma, belief in a marketplace. I mean, some, so is, some would say a government even, but not around here. <laughs> <laughs> is this something that um, you recommend be facilitated in a com- organizations in a facilitated session? You, you know, I think it's really, one is um, you, better, you, you, you better know um, how you're going to pull that off. Yeah, that's why um, I ask. Because, you know, I'll give you, uh, you better know how you can pull that off. Because what you can do is you can begin to exclude people. And, uh, mm. and that's what you don't, we, you know, we live in a world where we should be uh, adapting to how do, how do we become inclusive, mm-hmm. right? And then how do, we, how do we provide equity inside of the workforce? And when our opinions are so staunchy and they sound really rigid and we're not open-minded and humble, um, that doesn't bring people towards us. It actually makes them run in uh, another direction. So, uh, you know, faith would not be my first Place I would start. I think what I where I would start is, and I think for a lot of organizations, especially leaders, what they have to realize is you might read something that sounds really cool, but if you don't believe it yourself, mm-hmm. then don't repeat it. Um, yeah. I mean, these yeah. days authenticity is absolutely critical. I mean, so it's like you just you just can't say. I mean, you really have to walk the talk, and you know you've got to live it. And if you don't, then it's like you know it, it's very easy to be exposed as a fraud. Yeah, we talk to a lot of leaders about, they'll say something like, um, I want a great culture. And I'm like, well, what the, actually, I'm, I'm not sure that's true because you don't live like one. Mm-hmm. So for example, I want, I want a great organization when ultimately all they're doing is working to sell the company. Mm. Why don't you just, why don't you just tell people that? Yeah. Um, or, or, or find, yeah. No, go ahead, Scott. No, you can find people to adapt to what you believe in. But when you call one thing and you act another way, it's really confusing for people. I have street sweepers going by my office. I'm going to be totally transparent about this background noise going by. One other thing that you talk about that is related to this um, self-discovery and awareness and core values is you actually have said that you cannot threaten, coerce, or reward people into caring about you or your organization. I was surprised to see the word reward in there. Yeah, I think a lot of organizations believe that reward could mean um, it means one thing, and that's compensation. Um, the the highest reward of most people are just simple words of encouragement that you're good enough, that you're smart enough, uh, that you're big enough, that you're bright enough to make a difference. Uh, and so, uh, most rewards, most people think it's monetary. So it would be a check or a gift card. But what most people are really looking for are words, not necessarily paper or money. I think they're looking for feelings. I think they're looking for that appreciation. Like, you know, I really appreciate what you bring to the table every day or, I, you know, thank you for caring about me or helping me out during this difficult time. Um, I, 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 think it actually, I think it transcends words, actually. Yeah, my dad taught me something a long time ago, and I'll never forget it. It took me 10 years to figure it out, by the way, because I was so stinking arrogant. But he would, he would encourage people that were really not really doing a good job. I would be like, why do you do that? Like, they're sucking air. Why would you say nice things? Um, and he said, Scott, everybody needs encouragement, and the people that deserve it the least need it the most. And it took me a long time to figure that out, that there are a lot of people um, that do not deserve encouragement that need it the most. 
And it's amazing what just little words will do to people. So what would you say then to a, um, to a cynic then who might say then that, well, all you're doing though is you're uh, reinforcing bad behavior? Yeah, I mean, good point. I mean, I think it's probably, uh, it would probably be the number of times that you do it. I mean, one of the problems inside of a workforce is normally the destructive heroes get all the attention and the rock stars don't. And if you lean into your, the worst of your workforce all the time, the great people will leave and the bad people will stay. So that should be our, our, our new catchphrase. Re- reward the roadies. It's the roadies <laughs> that, 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 that make the show possible. That yes. make the rock stars rock stars. <laughs> We've had some guests on here say, oh, it's the five to one rule for every, you know, five compliments, one criticism. Do you have any best practice that you recommend regarding that? You know, we're really trying to lean into um, feed forward instead of feedback. Oh, well, so, how does that work? So it would be a lot of times feedback comes um, way too, like it's, it's after the fact. So it might be during an annual, annual review. You would say, hey, back in April, we had this meeting and you said this. Well, why, why don't human beings just have that feedback called feed forward the day it happens? Why do we have to wait for a review process to understand where we succeeded or where we failed? And, and why are we talking about stuff that's already happened or where, why aren't we talking about what's going to happen next? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm thing. dying to know this employee that, that dropped the mic on you. Are you, are you still in touch with her? You know, actually, what, here's what's amazing. So her name is Victoria Rieger. Okay. um, Hi, Victoria. (laughs) And she has been here um, almost uh, 25 years. Um, She's gone through breast cancer twice. And she is, uh, she's my rock inside this organization. And um, she's just a dear friend. So fortunately, she's still with us today. Fantastic. Tell tell us a little bit about your podcast, Side Effects, and everybody, it's effects with an A. (laughs) Yes, we have two, uh, uh, two podcasts. One is Side Effects yeah. with an A, where we're, uh, we talk about really what's going on inside of healthcare. It's 20% of our economy. It's a big, hot mess. It's, it's just riddled with greed and dysfunction. And it's the most self-serving industry I think I've ever laid my eyes upon. And it's a place where we're not afraid to call a spade a spade or talk about how we would maybe correct or uh, talk about healthcare in a different way. And one of the things we tout is the fact that we may be right, we may be wrong, but we're not afraid to talk about it. So we'll talk about health systems, we'll talk about pharmaceutical drugs, we'll talk about insurance companies uh, and the aspect of disease management. Uh, and um, we're not afraid to just have the courage to just call it out. I love it. He's looking for guests, folks. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, so I'm guessing I have a couple ideas as to how you might answer this question, but I am really curious. It's like, so what do you see as the number one healthcare related thing that plagues the workplaces today? Well, I mean, it's a great question. I think one of the issues is the fact that I think what, what society needs to wake up to is we're doing this to ourselves. So if basically 70% of the country is overweight, and half of the healthcare dollar is lifestyle based. We've created a healthcare system to fix lifestyle issues long term because we're not really willing to look at short term issues that we should be addressing ourselves. So it's a lifestyle issue. An example would be in this in the United States, we have five percent of the world's population, and we consume seventy percent of all the prescription drugs manufactured on Earth. We are consuming ourselves from the inside out. And then we're letting health systems, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, basically, um, we're letting them off the hook. uh, And the money that's being raised out of our dysfunction is just, it's unaffordable. So we're not going to have a government fix it. Um, What we're going to need to do is just wake up to the reality that we need to take care of ourselves. If we did, the system would go away. Well, I just had a full workup done this week, and I'm officially on the keto diet from my doc, so I am with you there, Scott. It is, it's, it's going to represent a huge change in the way that I consume, uh, but I'm excited about it, and uh, so I think you're right. 
I won't have to smell Brussels sprouts. That'd be great. No, I, well, <laughs> it's an excellent vegetable. And I, I love, well, it's a, uh, it's McGowan Braybender and that's the website. Obviously, Scott, um, what we would love for anybody who would like to get in touch with you to get a hold of you is uh, your email best or in which way would you like people to reach out to you? Yeah, probably, you know, email, but it's the longest email on the history of the planet. <laughs> it, it actually is. He's not lying. It is lying. <laughs> it's, uh, it's terrible. So, you know, the best way is, uh, is my, can I throw my cell phone out there? If you want to, yeah, it's your own so, peril. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So it's, uh, Everybody write this down. <laughs> area code 937-231-2572. Again, that's area code 937-231-2572. Be the fifth caller to Scott and you could win. And then, no, I'm just kidding. Exactly. Wait, more. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. What a pleasure sharing your story with us. It's so great to, to call you a friend of the podcast and we hope to talk to you again. Wow. Thanks for having me. I really yeah. appreciate thanks it. For, th thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information at salesfuel.com. Thank you.